My name is Henry Bernstein. I'm been a university teacher all my life, now retired from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. I've worked in various countries, in Turkey, in Tanzania, in South Africa, um, and uh, I still teach uh, each year at the China Agricultural University in Beijing. So I was invited to this conference uh, on food sovereignty to come and present a skeptical voice about food sovereignty. Why was I skeptical? Well, I think that food sovereignty is a very attractive notion, it's a very progressive notion, um, it is or is becoming a movement. So why, why was I skeptical? Um, I'm skeptical on certain points which arise from my own thinking and research and writing over the years, uh, and these points of skepticism are not to be dismissive of food sovereignty as a concept or a slogan. Um, and I suggested that in some ways the big concept, the big global vision of food sovereignty is less than the sum of the parts. And what I meant by that was there are many issues that food sovereignty raises, that, invest, that it investigates, that it tries to act on, that in a way we already knew about. I mean, there were how our farming economies work, the, the, the pressures that different types of farmers uh, confront uh, in their reproduction, the struggles that these can give rise to. I mean, these are all things that we, we knew about and studied. Um, the threats presented by globalizing corporate agriculture and so on. So the, these are all things that were being discussed that we were trying to understand. Now they are all collected under a big banner of food sovereignty. But is there a, a coherent vision, a unity in the concept of food sovereignty that can pull all this together and, of course, add more to it, a political program, um, a new way of thinking about food and about changing the world? And that's where I start to become a bit more skeptical. One reason is that I'm not convinced that many small-scale farmers who have to farm in extremely constrained conditions, that they can produce surpluses that are large enough to feed the rest of the world's population who, who aren't farmers, and that is the great majority and is becoming an ever larger number of people. And many of those who need to at the moment get their food by buying it are people who live in the countryside as well as in the cities. It's not simply uh, an issue of a rural-urban uh, uh, divide. Another uh, reason I'm partly sceptical, apart from this issue of, of productivity, uh, is that um, those people we might call peasants or small farmers or medium farmers or family farmers are not only very different from each other in different parts of the world, in different social circumstances, but they're often divided in certain ways as well. In other words, that there are class differences among peasants, among small farmers and other farmers in the countryside, and that any movement that seeks to mobilize energies uh, to, to, to push those energies in a certain direction, as food sovereignty does, it really has to confront the challenges and difficulties and, and contradictions of inequality in the countryside. Inequalities of class, inequalities of gender, of course, which is recognized by a movement like Via Campesina, and in many places also differences and divisions of ethnicity, uh, possibly of religion, um, of, of place of origin, and so on. So my skepticism is not that I disregard the very honorable and humane objectives of food sovereignty, but I think as a program, as a movement, it still has to go a considerable way 
to thinking about how to deal with these contradictions, which are not abstract contradictions, they arise when you uh, try to mobilize um, people for political purposes in, in rural, rural settings. So that is, um, you know, s several kinds of skepticism. Another kind of skepticism I have is about distributing food. It seems to me that a lot of the energy of food sovereignty thinking and practice is centered on growing food in ways that are superior to uh, how food is grown in a food system dominated by corporate capital. So growing food in more agroecological agro ways, environmentally friendly ways, socially just ways and so on. So a lot of the emphasis has been on the farmers. Um, but there are massive questions about how even if those farmers could produce enough food to feed the rest of uh, the population, how is that food going to reach those people who don't grow their own food, who live in cities, some of them in the countryside, and who uh, therefore have to acquire their food through markets or other means of distribution if these can be um, invented and employed. And in relation to that, one can imagine um, systems for doing this, which might be established by governments, by states, and so on. And I know that some Latin American countries have now officially adopted food sovereignty as, a, as part of their, their, their policy framework. But that is no guide to what actually happens or fails to happen on the ground uh, as a result of that. And uh, at this conference, various people have expressed um, skepticism about asking the state to play a central role in achieving food sovereignty at a national level or a regional level because much of the analysis that feeds into the food sovereignty concept uh, shows that states are more often the problem rather than the solution. So I think those are the grounds for some of my skepticism. It doesn't mean the skepticism is what Gramsci called or comes from what Gramsci called pessimism of the intellect. It's not uh, a skepticism that is dismissive of food sovereignty or uh, the activists in the food sovereignty movement who are clearly committed to bringing about a, a better world and who have a kind of optimism of the will that's always necessary to bring about positive change but I think that optimism of the will has to be disciplined and directed by a certain pessimism of the intellect to understand the contradictions of the world we inhabit the strength of the forces that food sovereignty confronts, big corporate capital, money capital, powerful states, but also, as I've emphasized, contradictions amongst the people, uh, the constituencies that food sovereignty wants to reach and to mobilize.